Chris, can you elaborate a little bit about your childhood here in America? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when I came to America in 1981, uh, it was in the middle of winter, and I remember that it was uh, nice because I had the Christmas holiday to get used to America, and then afterwards, uh, after the holiday, I started school, and it was uh, it, it was hard. Um, like I said, I was like the only uh, Asian in the whole school, and the children were very very mean. I still remember uh, they. Uh, you know, they didn't like who were different from them, and so they would pick on me, and they would, you know, call me names and everything. But it gave me a lot of satisfaction that these same students and the same children who picked on me as a second grader were became my best friends when I got into high school. And, and so people do change, but growing up as a child in Indiana, of all places, it was really hard. You had to really act and appear more American because you really look different. If you sounded different, you're in, in bigger trouble. And so in many ways, even though it was hard at that time, I think I'm very blessed to have the opportunity because it gave me a lot more insight on how Americans and America think. And so now when I ran for office, I was very comfortable talking to a Vietnamese person or an American non-Vietnamese person because basically I speak their language. And but for the fact that I look Vietnamese, I can think like an American. And so I think I earned a lot of their trust through knowing that background. So what appeared to be initially uh, a very bad situation, I think, was a very big blessing overall. Can you share with us your background, any high-ranking officials in your family? Well, let's see. My uncle, I believe, was at one point a uh, pretty high-ranking official. I believe he was an instructor at one of the reserve officer school in Vietnam. My family, uh, my dad, my uncle, and my other uncle, either military or, pol or politics. So I, I'm pretty sure that my desire to run for office and being in the military was all genetics. I don't think it had anything to do with me. I think my, uh, my upbringing from my family was a big part. And uh, I don't recall exactly what all my uncles and my uh, dad did. I know that my father was in the military for a little while he made the rank of a, I think, second lieutenant, and thereafter he too ran for office in Vinh Long uh, for city council, and then I think he was elected as well too. But I think in Vietnam was more of a province and not just a, the city. But I take after my uncle and my dad in that regard, and, and so uh, we do have some politics and, po and politicians and military in our family before me. Uh, but I think I was definitely the first uh, child in our family over here to take roots. And I think that's simply because when my uncle and my father came to America, they were much older and they need to get jobs to, to support their families and not worry about, you know, the bigger picture of serving the community. And by me having the, you know, the leisure and the time to go to school here and to acclimate to America, we're just slowly setting roots and continuing what my family did uh, before 1975. What about your grandpa? My grandfather, I feel so ashamed, but you know, when I was growing up, I was so young that I never spoke to him in detail about what he did. I know that you know he came from a very wealthy family. Um, there was a time in uh, Vin Long when I believe he would tell me that all the land that belonged to our family was as far as the eye could see. And when the Viet Cong came in 1975, that was all gone. And my, uh, my family, my mom and my uh, grandmother was basically shoved to the countryside. And so um, I lived and grew up in Vinh Long with my grandma and my mom. And I still remember they actually, my, my grandmother had the foresight to bury a lot of the gold and jewelry that we had in our family all over the countryside. And so when the Viet Cong you know, shoved us out to the countryside in the middle of the night, I would help my grandmother with a lantern and we would walk around all the different places where she buried the gold and the jewelry and we would dig them up over the years to sell in the black market to survive. For me as a child, that was always fun, you know. I didn't know what she was doing. I just followed, just followed her just trying to retrieve all the gold and everything. But looking back now, I'm very, you know, um, amazed at the foresight that my grandmother had to basically put away what we had in order for us to survive all those years under the communist control. What if you, um, as an attorney right now, you can make um, good money, good living 
why did you choose disco as the community? Can you tell us? Yeah, I, for me, money is not that important. Um, when I had my own law firm, I was probably the poorest attorney in Little Saigon because and wherever, whoever came to the door, they would tell me their, their story. And I took a whole lot of cases without any money. And I wanted to serve so badly to help them out of their situations. So I never took any money. But I realized I couldn't live doing that. And so I wanted to have a way to, to give back. And by running for office, um, at least uh, I can still do that. And now working as a deputy district attorney, I can help uh, to ensure safety and uh, security for our community at the same time with the city council, still use that time to serve people in a different way. Um, you know, I protect our community from crimes and from the bad things at the same time for those who cannot help themselves. As a city councilman, I can certainly help, may be trying to pay for a parking ticket or trying to help them with their housing situation. It's all the little stuff that makes you know, our community what it is. And I just try to do my very best to be just a small factor to make it more positive. Being raised here in the United States, what do you consider yourself as an American, a Vietnamese? I definitely consider myself a Vietnamese American. I, I am I'm blessed in the sense that growing up, my, my parents never allowed me to be 100% American. And at the same time, I was in an environment where I could not be 100% Vietnamese. So I, I really feel honored that I am basically a, a crossbreed of both. And I'm comfortable in, in both. Even though my Vietnamese is nowhere near as fluent as my English, I can adequately get by. And I honor and respect the culture and still you know, know what it takes to be um, uh, polite to our elders, to still know the customs. Um, just recently, when I had my engagement with my fiance, she and I we discussed and we actually had you know a little heated argument about you know should we bow before our elders or not and how much bowing should we do? Should we do the whole bowing or should we just fat you know? And I'm like no, we gotta do this the right way. So I still honor and and that and value the true tradition that we have been passed down from generations. But at the same time, you know, having been raised in Indiana. I definitely know what it's like to be an American. And, and so I'm just very honored just to be able to walk both sides pretty well. Thank you for being here today. And uh, can you tell us your name and your profession? Yes, my name is uh, Chris Fon. I am an attorney by profession. And my rank in the US Navy is Lieutenant Commander. What day did you come to the uh, US and uh, how was your journey? I came to the United States in 1981. I was very blessed because my father had escaped after the Vietnam War in 1975. At that time, I was about one years old, so my, uh, my mom and dad didn't want to risk me uh, dying on the high seas because he escaped by, by boat. And so uh, he sponsored my mom and me to the United States about uh, eight years later. It was 1981, and I flew from, India, from Vietnam to Indiana and that was in 1981. I was about eight years old. And how was life like for you when you grew up? It was very hard because of the fact that, um, you know, as you know, growing up in Vietnam, I was in uh, a city called Vinh Long, which is about maybe half an hour to an hour south of Saigon. And so when I came to the United States, it was in 1981, and it was, the transition was pretty hard. Um, we went from basically the, May, the Mekong Delta to the middle of winter in Indiana right after Christmas. And so the adjustment to the seasons was, uh, was hard, but more so it was because the language and the people were all so different. I often joke that I doubled the size of the Asian community in Carmel, Indiana from a zero to one when I got there. Um, my first uh, day in school after I got there after Christmas was pretty hard. The whole class was all blue-eyed, uh, blue blonde-haired children. I was the only child with uh, black hair, so it took a while to get used to. I see you're in uh, military form, so uh, why did you choose military for a career? Well, I always wanted to serve uh, our, our, our country. I, I'm very thankful for the United States, and so from a very young age, I wanted to give back to this wonderful country. And so after I got uh, through with uh, college and through with law school, 
I decided to join the military after that as a Navy lawyer. Can you tell us um, what it's like to be in the military? It's wonderful. I think I would highly encourage any uh, young person to join the military. It gives you a lot of discipline. For me personally, um, I was raised as the oldest child. It was very hard for me to uh, have the college life because um, I had to help my mom and dad raise my younger siblings. And so I really didn't have the college experience where you go and have fun and party up with your friends. I had to study, I had to work full time. And so for me, it was, aside from serving our country, was a way to see the world without having to spend my own money. Um, so the Navy and I was basically made for each, each, each other. When I got done with law school, I actually missed the application deadline for uh, the applications for, that, for that, that year. But I wanted so badly to join, so I called up uh, the board uh, president after they had met. And I'm like, I know I am completely missed the deadline, but can you please just look at my files and see if I qualify? I guess because of the sincerity and the desire that she sensed in my voice, about a week later she called me back and said, even though the board has already met, we will still uh, admit you into the JAG Corps. And each year they only take about 10 uh, students around the nation uh, for this program. So I was very honored and blessed to be ac accepted. Have you ever served overseas? And if so, can you elaborate? I did. Actually, my first tour was actually in New Jersey, um, right across the harbor from Manhattan when 9-11 happened. Um, our base basically has a clear view of the Manhattan skyline when um, you know, uh, it was a clear day. I still remember I, was, uh, I got to my first tour in April of, of 2001. And so a few months later, I was on the pier about to conduct a court martial. And I still remember that one fateful morning, it was a very clear day in, in, in New York City. And my back was turned to the skyline when the first plane hit. I didn't see the first plane hit. We thought it was an accident. And so we would try to convene the court martial on the ship. Within about 15 minutes, uh, the captain got on the, uh, on the intercom and said, all sh non-ship's company, get off the, the, the ship. We have to pull out. So as I was waiting to get off the ship, was when I saw the second plane come around and hit the Twin Towers. Um, so drastically, my life and the military changed completely because the base was the closest base to Manhattan. And so that weekend, we actually were the spearhead to relief the effort to help with the disaster in downtown Manhattan. So after that, uh, that tour, I was able to witness 9-11 live. I went overseas to uh, serve in Japan, where I was the naval prosecutor for the Far East. So basically all the crimes that the Marines and the, the Navy sailors did from Hawaii over to Japan, we took care of that entire region. So I had a lot of miles that I put on between <laughs> Hawaii, Japan, and Guam just to take care of all of our troops in that area. After um, I served in, J in New Jersey and Japan, um, I want to come back to California. And this will lead into the next chapter of my life, which is running for office. But I always want to come back to serve our community here in California because growing up as a child, I would come here to vacation and my uncle lived here. And I always just admired the diversity and the cohesiveness that we have here in Little Saigon and in our Vietnamese com community here. Compare here to Indiana, I mean, I, this is like heaven to me here. So I always want to come back to California. My problem was I didn't know how to get here. So how I, fi I figured was, you know, after I serve in New Jersey, if I go to Japan, I can still see the world. But after I get done with Japan, they have to return me somewhere back in the United States. And California was the closest state to Japan. So after that, I said, hey, I've served in New Jersey for you. I've served in Japan. Now you know, they said you served two heartfelt tours. Wherever you want to go in the world, we'll let you go. So I said, I want California. So they said, okay. So they gave me a, ch a choice to go with the Navy SEALs in uh, Coronado. And so I came back and I served uh, with the Navy SEALs. And then I was blessed to go to Iraq with them for six months as their lawyer and served in, in Fallujah, where I was basically their in-house counsel. And uh, we took care of trying to uh, work them through and help them with the uh, transition in Iraq and all the rules of engagement, laws of armed conflict, who the SEALs can capture, who the SEALs can kill, and that was my primary job. And then after I was uh, done with Iraq, I came back, and that's when I deactivated from active duty. I served eight years all that time between uh, New Jersey, Japan, and Iraq, and California, 
eight years of active duty, but I realized that I've had my fun and I've you know, seen a lot and I've served our country. So now I want to come back and serve our community. And that's uh, in 2008 was when I came back to California and then set up roots here. Did you meet uh, many Vietnamese Americans um, in the, uh, on the battlefield? I did, actually, and that leads to how we formed the uh, Vietnamese American Armed Forces Association. What had happened was I was helping some SEALs uh, to uh, be a witness to one of the insurgents that they had captured the week before. So we flew into Baghdad, and I was waiting on the flight line to get out of Baghdad to go back to Fallujah. Well, I was waiting at the counter trying to get our flight out. And I, I was speaking English, but apparently some person behind me said I sounded like Vietnamese. So he tapped my shoulder, I turned around, and it happens to be, um, his name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tha Nguyen. Yeah, Dung Ta Tha. Um, he was just a, just a great guy. Um, and he says, oh, you sounded Vietnamese. And I'm like, really? Nobody has ever said that to me before. But so I turned around and we made, uh, you know, we made contact and we, we became friends. And when we came back to the, the United States, we wanted to establish an association that could actually help and preserve uh, the culture of our, our sisters and brothers in the military. And so that's how the Vietnamese American Armed Forces Association was established between he and I and a few other brothers and sisters who we met on the front line. Can you tell us what VAASA stands for? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah it stands for Vietnamese American Armed Forces Association. So it comprises of all uh, of the five branches in the military, and we just invite all of um, the uh, soldiers and sailors and Marines of Vietnamese American background to come and be in this group. And it's a networking um, place where we get together, share our ideas, share our thoughts, and then one of our big thing was we would send care packages to uh, the Vietnamese American troops who were deployed uh, during these last few years in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we make these care packages, and in there we include uh, items of Vietnamese American relevance. For example, like pho or cafe soda or something that has a touch of, of home. And so through word of mouth and through uh, different friends who know about our association, they would send us information about the deployed troops and would send it to them. Aside from that, we also actually establish a scholarship foundation where basically we try to honor the 13 Vietnamese American brothers who have died in the line of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. So every other year uh, we would uh, raise $13,000 and award uh, scholarships to uh, students across the United States of Vietnamese American background and we just ask them to submit us a, a essay uh, statement about you know different things and then our brothers and sisters sit down and then we evaluate what they write and then we try to award them these the scholarships for that for that year. And uh, tell us why did you join? Join the, the military? Uh, well, actually, I was one of the founders, and so um, I often joke that I was the founding president, but that has no bearing on my ability because I think I was a reservist at the time, so I was the only one who was, I was available to actually run this show. So all of our other brothers were busy with family or with uh, being a active duty and flying all over the world. So I was the only one here in California. So they uh, basically elected me to be the founding president. But it was a, a, an honor because basically I put a lot of effort into it with our brothers and sisters help. And uh, now the association is very, very strong. We're over uh, 150 members strong. On Facebook, we're over 1,000 members. And um, you know, we have membership all the way from DC to Japan. So uh, it's, it's very nice to see that we're very cohesive in this group. So do you find it uh, very fulfilling? It is. This organization? It, it, it certainly is. I mean, uh, there's, I think, very few things I think I find more rewarding than to make sure that we take care of each other. And now that I think I'm a little bit older than before, it, it, it gives me pleasure to give back and to support the younger uh, uh, friends and brothers and sisters who are coming into the, mi the military now just to show them you know, the ropes and save them some of the trouble that we didn't have when we were trying to find our way through the course. Do you know how many Vietnamese Americans found in the military um, at their career? I would say just a rough estimate, probably about 5,000. Uh, it's hard to say because it's a, a privacy matter, so it's not public knowledge. But I would say a guesstimate about 5,000 altogether, not many. How many of them are in combat, do you know? Uh, I would probably guess that with the recent uh, wars, 
um, all of them have probably been deployed at some point or another. I would say probably maybe 80% have been deployed. To see combat, though, that's more unique. And so I would probably say mm, roughly maybe about 15% of that number has seen combat. They fast for BAASA have many members uh, lost their lives on the duty. Do you have any close friends that die in the battlefield? I do not have m friends who have died, which I feel very blessed about. But uh, through the scholarships that we formed, I've met many of the family members and the parents who've lost their children to combat. And it's very touching and it's, it's um, very hard when you first meet them because, you know, it's like you don't really know what to say and how to react or how to behave. But I've, uh, I've had very touching and close conversations with them and have developed very strong friendships with uh, the parents of our love or, uh, or beloved brothers who've died. What made you change uh, from military to uh, political? Well, I've always wanted to serve. I think all through my entire life, it may be service to my family, to others, to our country, to our community. I always wanted to have a chance to, to serve, to live more than of myself, you know. And so after serving our country, having a great time doing it, I want to come back and serve, in particular, our Vietnamese American community. Um, I could have chosen anywhere in, in the country to run for office, but I realize here is where I'm, I am most want to be and where I think I can have the most help. I know that even though you know America has become more progressive, there is still an issue of race and perhaps pre prejudice and stuff like that. So I realize when I come back to California, um, I want to serve the community, and that includes Caucasian, Latinos, uh, Vietnamese Americans, Koreans, but I still appreciate the fact that I am a Vietnamese American and I want to reach out to our Vietnamese American community to have that base of support. And so I want to come back and, and give up myself to the community. So that's why last year I, I uh, took a year off and basically walked every single day door to door in Garden Grove just to have the opportunity. Do you find the transition difficult? Um, yes. I mean, I have to say, because in the military, we're very rigid, we're very focused. Uh, on the civilian side, uh, there's not as much focus, and so you have to basically bring that focus with you. You have to basically force yourself and have the discipline to make things happen. Um, like last year, when I walked every day door to door for five hours a day for the whole year, through rain or shine, I mean, nobody was there to shove me or make me do it. I had to basically find it in myself, even though I may be tired or I may be depressed because the day before, you know, I met some people who were not so nice to me. You have to find the strength within yourself to carry on. And I think that, you know, is from the, our culture through my family's teaching and from the military. It gave me the inner fire to go on in light of all the adversity that could be facing me. As far as... Um as an officer elected and an appointed judge, how do you scale your time to fulfill your duty and have time for family? Well, the great thing is um, actually my fiance, who we're getting married here in November, uh, she's actually the youngest sister of one of my brothers who we met in the military. Um, I met him, how it all happened was I was trying to recruit and find people to join VAFA. And so I just shot emails to all the people in the uh, global that we had on the, uh, on the Navy's website there with last names, of Vietnamese last names like Nguyen, Pham, Phang, and all that. So I shot an, an, an email out with a bunch of people, didn't know who they were, just by, by their last names. And coincidentally, one of the, the people replied. It happens to be uh, now my future brother-in-law, but at that time we didn't know each other. So we became friends, and Harry actually joined VAFA and was in charge of the computers and website. And so when he got commissioned to be an officer, he invited me over to Newport to uh, be uh, one of his uh, friends to, uh, to witness it. And lo and behold, his family was there, his kid sister was there, and then that's how I found my future wife. To answer your question though, um, as far as family, it's very hard, but I'm very blessed that my fiance is very understanding. And actually when um, I was campaigning, she would walk with me and uh, basically um, there were times when I could not reach certain homes. She would actually type the address labels for us to send the letters to them and to ask them to vote for us. So she's very un un understanding, but I realize that it's going to be very hard in the future when I have a family and children to worry about, to worry about also the community 
and to worry about, you know, my pro profession too. But, you know, I, I, I chose this path. And so I will gladly accept whatever comes my way and do it the best that I can. Let's go back. Um, when, how was the uh, last election? The last election was a lot of fun. Um, I, I often believe and I will always want to believe that you don't need a lot of money to win an election. I wanted to prove to myself that you don't need to have a whole lot of money to win it on your first try. And how you combat the lack of money is you have to put everything you have and a lot of effort. And that's why I took the whole year off to actually walk. Because I realized that I think if you have the ability to connect with people and see them and talk to them and shake their hands and look them in the eyes and say, hey, I don't have a lot of money, but please support me. What I did was I didn't mail a whole lot. The city of Garden Grove has 180,000 people. I only mailed 600 mails. And, I only, and those mails, because I couldn't reach them because they had like, do not knock on our door or there were gates or whatever. But I was able to reach many, many people and I didn't mail a whole lot. So what I did was I, I printed out three uh, flyers in English, Viet Vietnamese and Spanish. And I would go to their house and if they were not home, I would actually have a, 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 a sticker that I would say, dear Mr. and Mrs. whatever their name is, I was here, I'm sorry I missed you. Please, you know, call me if you have any uh, questions, and I'd love to have your support. And for those who were actually at home, I would talk to them. Some of them, you know, depending on how much in interest they had, I sat there with them for like a half an hour talking about the issues for the community and then just asked them to put the flyer on their refrigerator and say, you know what, I won't be back this way. So I don't have the money to send you reminders. Just make sure you put the flyer on the re refrigerator door so when come election time, you'll remember me. And thankfully, they they did. But I really enjoy it because of the fact that I think the key to anything is the personal, the people contact. So I just try my best and just go out there and just meet people and just ask for their support. So now, are you really happy with your decision? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's not so much my decision. I, I really do believe, I don't know what your preference is religion-wise, but I do believe in destiny. And I believe that no matter how hard you try, you're your destiny is already written. It's a matter of getting there, you know? And I really do believe that with my service to our country, with um, the chance of running for office and getting elected, I feel very, very blessed. And I'm just doing whatever I can, but I really do feel that, you know, whatever is meant to happen uh, is, is happening. What is your plan for the future five, ten years from now? Well, I want to have a very happy family. I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. And I want to be the best person I can for our community. Um, and I'll do whatever it takes. Um, and however long the community wants me, I will give of myself completely to make sure that we have a very united and very strong community. What about career-wise? Career-wise, um, who, 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 who really knows? I mean, I, right now, as you know, I'm also with the uh, district attorney's office. I'm actually a uh, deputy district attorney for Orange County. And so that's one part of my life. I, uh, I, that's my full-time job. City council is a part-time position. And as far as you know, going for higher office or doing other things in politics, like I said before, I would do as much as the community wants me to do. And I will give it all I have to make sure that you know, we, uh, we do the best that we can for our, our people and our community. What do you want to share um, for the young people about military life, um, think of it as a role model, do you feel that uh, you have some words for the uh, young people? Yeah, I think military service is just such a noble calling. I, I, I really don't think there's another profession that can give you as much reward and as much satisfaction. Whenever I, I think about it, I, I always remember a, a saying that uh, uh, our president, uh, John F. Kennedy, used to say. And, uh, you know, he says, when someone asks you, what did you do in your life that has any meaning, you can always say that you served in the United States Navy. And for him and for me, we're in the Navy, so we say that. But I think for any branch, as long as you give more of yourself uh, to the service of others and to the service of, of your nation, I think there's no higher calling. And with my brother now, who's actually, you know, going through SEAL training and wanting to become a, Na a Navy SEAL, when he was commissioned as an, an officer, I was the one who signed his papers. And I have this picture of him looking over my shoulder as I was signing the paper, he was all smiling and everything. 
And I thought to myself, you know, did I just sign his death warrant? Because by me signing this and saying that, you know, I'm an officer signing for another officer, he's now going to be an officer too. But is he going to die because of my signing this paper? But I really think that everybody has a destiny, and I think that you should do what you love. And as long as my brother likes what he does, and for all of the young people in the future, as long as they're doing for the right reasons, I think they will thoroughly love it. Because I did it for my reasons, like I told you, I want to serve our country and see the world, and that's exactly what I did. And uh, I think by the result of the election, uh, by the fact that I'm still in the Navy Reserve now, um, I think it speaks volume. I mean, this first step for military service is just so important, not only for yourself and your family, but also, you know, how the community views you in the bigger picture. Do you have anything else that you would like to share today? Well, I, I'm just so honored to, you know, have lived this amazing life. Um, I never spoke one word of English until I was 10 years old from Vietnam, and uh, just to have the opportunity that I've had uh, to go to school, to serve our country, to see the world, and now to come back full circle and serve our community and have the, uh, you know, the chance to do all that is just amazing. And I really, you know, thank America. I thank uh, all the opportunities that we have here. I often joke that I wonder how my life would have turned out had I stayed in Vietnam or had we gone to another country that's not America. And uh, even though America is going through some hard times, I really feel and believe that we are the greatest nation in the world. And when we're out there on the front lines, we're truly defending freedom. Um, I mean, after World War II, America could have been the only country in the, in the world because we had the atomic bomb and no one could have stopped us. But we're not that type of people. We are there to preserve freedom. We're there to give back you know, to others who don't have what we have. And so every day I put on the uniform, I feel that there's a higher calling than just me, you know. So my words to the younger generation is serve, because whatever you get out of it, um, I'm sure you will get 10 more times than what you expect you would. On behalf of VA Sheriff, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much.